My name is Shirley Thiessen. I am a mom who is grieving the death of my 23-year-old son. I am not a journalist, a producer, or even a videographer. However, I felt compelled to create a video that features personal grief stories from people in my faith community. The pain in grief has the potential to make each one of us more lonely or drive us deeper into community. I have personally experienced the value of choosing a community that companions with me in my grief. I'm convinced stories must be shared. The motive behind the stories is to bring hope to those who are bereaved and introduce you to others who understand grief. You are not alone. Without the courageous participants who are vulnerable in sharing their hearts and their stories, there would be no video. These inspiring people, who you'll meet in a moment, are my heroes. I invite you, dear grieving friend, to lean in and listen. And as you do, I trust your heart will be encouraged by the golden threads of hope woven into the fabric of each and every story. Hope is Jesus Christ. He wants to be the hope in your story as well. My son Simon was a very spontaneous, uh, very creative in so many ways, uh, particularly off the wall in his uh, type of humour. I think the whole of the family, we were all uh, grew up on Monty Python, so there were so many times where he would come out with quite outrageous things. Yeah, so it was 13th of May 1991. I think got home at about 4.35, and from what I remember, we immediately had a phone call from Simon's girlfriend, Suzanne, and it was basically, she was very worried about him, that he had not returned from a trip into the mountains. Soon after that, two detectives arrived, and you could just tell by the look on their face that this was not good news. And uh, they, they said they thought that Simon had died in a car crash uh, in the field area. And it's, uh, I think like most people that go through this, you just feel like you're in a daze. You just can't imagine that this could have happened. Between age 17 and age 52, my life was great. I was trained as an architect. I had, had met Jennifer at college. Um, what more could I need? I had a wonderful family, had enough money to you know, have a reasonably good life. Uh, we probably contributed to a lot of causes and did a lot of things that we even do now, but I didn't have any desire or need for anything spiritual. On the following Sunday, I remember being in our bedroom beautiful day, almost like today, uh, beautiful blue sky, and it was, it was warm, the sun was coming through and it was warm, and I just had a, a sense of somebody holding me. That's all I can say, no words or anything like that, but I had somebody almost saying, be calm, be still, I'm, I'm going to look after you. And with that experience, and then obviously meeting with the uh, pastor that had been recommended to us by uh, Simon's girlfriend's uh, mother. I think a series of things started to happen that were, you know, somehow part of that process. I mean, I really didn't understand what was going on at the time, but I, I, I can fondly remember back to that moment. It was, uh, it was certainly life changing. I do not remember saying to Simon, "I love you." I just don't remember it. If I did, it's been taken out of my memory, and I don't remember hugging him. I just, you know, I think it's part of the British Reserve, rather like when we first joined the small church we joined, to have men come up and hug me was really weird. <laughs> I just sort of almost wanted to pull back. So, yeah, that just wasn't in, in my DNA. That has changed in our family. I think soon after that, you know, we're very clear about the fact that we, we every phone call it ends with, I love you. And uh, when we get together, hugging is definitely very important, yeah. Uh, before Simon died, I don't remember crying. Now, I'm probably worse or better, whichever way you want to call it. I'm quite teary. <laughs> and I, I, honestly, I'm glad. I mean, I think in some ways in the early days, I felt some level of guilt that I had avoided 
I, I had six Christians working for me, so it wasn't like I wasn't exposed, but I probably wouldn't have allowed them to even come anywhere near me with any kind of message. So, yeah, I felt some level of guilt in the beginning that, you know, Simon didn't have any encouragement to study this. But over time, I think I've realized that it's not, it's not for me to make the decision. And uh, there are so many things that could, could have been going on in the background. And yeah, I'm reminded often about the faith on the one side of Jesus who, uh, you know, in the, literally the last seconds of his life makes the decision to, to come to Christ and he gets warmly welcomed. So I don't know, I don't know what the answer is and I, I put total faith in God to work that one out. It's, it's, I, I, I no longer feel any guilt about it. My daughter, Ray Lynn, she was 20 months old, and she was just the happiest little girl, just uh, curious, liked to dance in circles, and I loved uh, singing to her, and she just would hum along with, with me. July 13th, 2002, on a Saturday night, our family decided uh, that we had three kids uh, at the time, four-year-old Justin, three-year-old Megan, and 20-month-old Ray Lynn. Uh, we decided to go to church on Saturday night um, just because we had another little neighborhood girl with us and we thought wouldn't it be nice to just attend church on a Saturday night and uh, um, pastor I still remember that service to this day it was um, very meaningful um, at, at the time I, I didn't know how meaningful it was going to be to me pastor Ryan was speaking he was speaking about what is most important in your life he had us visually write down on a piece of paper an arrow and tried to put things in order about what might get us through during a hard time. What's the most important thing in your life? At that point, he also shared a quote from Johnny Depp who had said that his daughter was the most important thing in his life. And without his daughter, he would have no reason for living. So then after church, we decided uh, we, rather than bring this little girl home with us, we would bring her home to her house, just make it easier on her mom. It was a nice day to have a lemonade in the backyard. So we were there about 10 minutes, um, and there's a lot of things that happened, but at the end of the day, we lost our daughter in a, a drowning accident um, in their indoor pool. There was a side door left open. So that was the most devastating um, day of my life. And I, at that point, I wasn't sure if I'd ever be happy again. It's been 13 years since we lost our daughter. And at that time, I would have thought I could never have joy again. I thought, this is it, I'm done. I, check me out, I'm never gonna be happy again. In hindsight, I can say that I've experienced joy, I am happy again. I still think about Ray Lynn, our whole family does. So you can find joy again and you can experience uh, God walking with you through these very difficult moments. We don't know what that's gonna look like, but, but he'll be there. My son Matthew was 22 when he entered Heaven's Gates. Uh, he was compassionate. He was a talented, great musician. Uh, he loved the outdoors. And one thing that his mother always said, that he was a great hugger. Actually, she even to this day says he's a better hugger than I am. So uh, when Matthew was promoted to Heaven, he was working at a oil and gas camp up in uh, Fort McMurray. Uh, Matthew had uh, addiction problems, and um, we know that uh, he was robbed, uh, ran on a, a construction site, and uh, fell down an elevator shaft and died at uh, 4.15 on October 13th, uh, 2013. Uh, had our Thanksgiving dinner with my family, seated and went to bed. 11 o'clock, the doorbell rang, and the Calgary City Police uh, informed us that our son had passed away on a construction site and needless to say life after that has never been the same as like there's an emptiness and a loneliness that uh, is, can never be filled. 
Matthew was a great musician, and in the early stages of this, uh, the silence in the house was deafening. Yes, there's tears there every day. Uh, I find that driving home from work is the hardest for me. Uh, too much time to reflect and too much time to think. Matthew's, I have a picture of Matthew in my uh, visor. And then the sun, when it's sunny and I put the visor down, he's just there smiling right at me. So, and, and that's when the tears just start to flow on knowing what I'm going to miss. Because uh, Matthew was our only child. I'll never be a uh, grandfather. Our first Christmas, uh, we went back to Newfoundland and uh, spent time with our, the family. Uh, we did place a, a stocking at the, uh, at the fireplace for Matthew. And what we did ask was all family and friends uh, to uh, send us a memory or send it to my sister-in-law a memory, uh, which they did and they placed in a stocking. And on Christmas night, we took the stocking down and we read all the, the memories. We laughed and cried, but it was, it was a beautiful experience. When we came back from Newfoundland, we walked into my brother-in-law's house in Beaumont, and we sat down, and there was a tree next to the next to the Chesterfield, and Darlene started looking at it. The lights were on. She said, is that a Matthew tree? And my sister-in-law was like, yes, mission accomplished. So what she had done was contacted all the uh, uncles and aunts and cousins and asked them if they would send an ornament uh, that reminded them of Matthew so she could put it on the tree. And uh, none of them got together and planned what they were going to do. And uh, so my sister-in-law said, as the ornaments start coming in, it was, a, it was a big surprise to her that nothing was the same. She was expecting lots of guitars to come. And like there were birds came in, curling brooms, quads, gadoos, frogs, uh, deer, fish, all kinds of things that Matthew had done. It was a blessing and they all had attached a little note as to why they sent it. And so to this day, the, we, we've kept the tree up. It's in, uh, it's in our living room upstairs in the house and uh, it's a blessing to go over at times when you feel a little lonely, you just go over to the tree and, and you look at it and you reflect on how much uh, in his short life he touched so many people and the uh, opportunity we had to have him for 22 years that we were so thankful for. There's times when we've struggled and, and Darlene has struggled and I, I wouldn't know what to say or, or, or do. And I'm like, oh God, like somebody call. Let somebody please phone. And the phone, about an hour or two later, the phone would ring with unexpected people that we haven't heard from in years with words of encouragement. So like the Lord has opened doors and touched us immensely. I don't understand why Matthew went so early. I believe it's God's will. Uh, do I like his will? No. I'll probably understand it when I get to heaven. Uh, people ask me what would be the first question I'd ask. I said, I don't know. I won't, be care I won't care what the first question is when I get to heaven. I'd be just so anxious to see Matthew, so anxious to see God that the cares I hear don't matter. And if it wasn't for our faith, I wouldn't be able to get through this because if we didn't have the hope and, and belief that there is life after after death and that God is coming back again one day and we're all going to be reunited, I wouldn't be able to get through this because without hope you have nothing.